This is the second in a series of webinars brought to you by the South Florida Business Council. The South Florida Business Council is a coalition of the Chamber of Commerce of the Palm Beaches, the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce, and the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce. We're all working together to throw the spotlight on and work on some of the critical regional issues facing South Florida. I'm Alfred Sanchez. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, for the weeks now, I can't remember how many, maybe it's 13, 14 weeks now, we've all been dealing with uh, this regional and national uh, crisis, the ramifications of COVID-19, the pandemic, that has not only affected our physical and emotional, but also our economic health. But most of all, most of us have never seen anything like what we're facing today. There are no roadmaps for us to follow as business leaders or as investors. So what should we be focusing on? How do we position our businesses to get through uh, this crisis and succeed? And what about our portfolios? What should our consideration be when, uh, when we're trying to manage our wealth and our investments in this new reality? which really has upended uh, what in just a few months ago were tried and true investments, corporations that you could count on. Uh, now, perhaps not so much. Well, to help us answer those questions, we've uh, assembled a great panel of experts in the business and investment field. Uh, we have with us today, Ramiro Ortiz. He's the senior advisor at McCombie Group a strategic uh, and M&A advisory uh, firm that's focused on restructuring and transitioning middle market businesses. Ramiro has nearly 50 years of leadership operations and sales experience serving as a senior executive in various South Florida institutions, including as president of Bank United and SunTrust Bank. Ramiro is a dedicated uh, community servant He's been the chairman of the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce. He's co-chaired the United Way of Miami-Dade County. And as an elected member of the Orange Bowl Committee, he's been, uh, that's just among the numerous, numerous civic roles that he's played. Uh, he's a graduate of the School of uh, Bank Administration at the University of Wisconsin. And welcome, Ramiro. Also with us is David McCombie. He is the founder and CEO of the McCombie Group an advisory firm focused on restructuring, turning around, and transitioning middle market businesses. An ongoing contributor to Forbes regarding strategy, restructuring, and turnarounds, he's also been a featured speaker at various private equity conferences and has been profiled on the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg. He's also served as an adjunct professor at the University of Miami and a contributor and author of the Complete Direct Investment Handbook, a guide for families, offices, qualified purchasers, and accredited investors, published by Wiley. Uh, previous to his stint as uh, the CEO of his company, he's also been a consultant at McKinsey and Company on investment banking uh, and Citigroup. He's a graduate of law, uh, Harvard Law School with a focus on negotiation and corporate bankruptcy, and also did extensive coursework in corporate finance at Harvard Business School. So welcome to uh, David, uh, and thank you for joining us. Lastly, I wanna introduce a good friend of mine, uh, uh, and, and uh, that's Jay Pelham. You'll know Jay, uh, many of us knew Jay when he was president of Total Bank. Well, now he's president of both Kaufman, Ross & Wealth, and Kaufman Ross and Insurance Services. Jay Pelham leads the wealth management and insurance services affiliates of CPA and advisory firm Kaufman Ross. Uh, there he serves clients uh, as, uh, and he serves as a client principal. For more than 30 years, Jay's worked in high, with high net worth families and individuals in South Florida. As I said, he was also the president of Total Bank. He's dedicate, he's dedication to fostering client relationships, extensive experience in financial services industry, and continued philanthropic efforts in our community make him ideally suited for the advisory role. I want to thank you, uh, Jay, for being a part of this. And uh, really, uh, it was Jay and uh, Ramiro who gave birth to the idea of this uh, relationship. Uh, I also should say that Jay serves as a member of the board for the Greater Miami Chamber and uh, was uh, had great success in the last economic summit that he chaired. Thank you, Jay, for being with us. Now, an important part of our time today is getting to your questions. So I wanna just lay some of the house rules so that we have an efficient meeting. 
first of all, first of all, everyone is muted during the call while our presenters are presenting. To submit a question, you'll notice at the bottom of the Q and A tab. Use that to write down your questions. Uh, if you have any sort of uh, comments you want to make on the side or if you want to share information or uh, chat with one another, the chat uh, room is uh, there for you to use that. Again, if you want to ask our panelists a question, we'll have time at the end. Please submit it into the Q&A because only those questions are going to be uh, brought up for the panelists. All right. So those are the rules. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Now let's start our program by turning over to my good friend, Ramiro. Ramiro, welcome. Thank you, Alfred. It's, uh, it's always good to be involved uh, in any kind of activity with the Chamber. It feels almost like uh, old home week. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, by way of background, I spent uh, a little bit over 40 years in South Florida banking. I was fortunate enough to head up SunTrust Bank Miami and Bank United. Uh, I must confess that after retiring from banking, I've done a very lousy job of staying retired as I keep jumping into uh, new adventures. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting David McCombie about 20 years ago. He and I did a couple of projects together when I first retired from banking. The projects went very well. He and I have stayed in touch over the years and continued, have continued to do some things together. And formally, we partnered up a few months ago and things are going very, very, very well. I'd like to turn it over to David McCombie, who's the founder and CEO of the McCombie Group. David? Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Ramiro. I appreciate that. And Susan, if we can start up the, uh, the slides. So <clears throat> as, uh, as Alfred said, uh, my name is David McCombie and I run McCombie Group. We're a full service strategic and M&A advisory firm uh, and really with a focus on the middle market companies here in South Florida. Unfortunately, during COVID, the overwhelming majority of our work has really focused on um, companies in distress. And so the focus of today's presentation is really going to be on uh, how you can take your business to the next level um, and um, both survive and thrive during this, this COVID um, curveball that we've all been thrown. My hope is that, uh, that some of these things are not necessarily relevant uh, to you, that your business is in strong shape, but if it's not, um, hopefully this will be helpful and as well with uh, some of your friends. Next slide. So, um, you know, there's been plenty of presentations around PPP and some of the other governmental stimulus programs. And I encourage you, if you have not applied for them to take full use of anything that is available. Unfortunately, uh, for most businesses, it is gonna be inadequate to fully support um, all of their operations and generally there's gonna be a gap. And with some of them, there's actually the need to repay it, right? So the way that we think about uh, uh, business within COVID is there's both the short term and the midterm. The short term is we need to survive until business operations resume the some sense of normalcy. Um, it's unclear of when we will go back to February of 2020, uh, but it is absolutely essential that businesses find a way to be sustainable during this period. Um, and then over the midterm is really changing operations to be sustainable, uh, what is likely to be a very different operating environment than in the past. Uh, using a hockey analogy, it's very important that we skate to where the puck is going, not where it currently is at. And so we're not 100% sure where things are going with the virus, with the economy, with different demographic and other shifts that are occurring as a result of this virus. But we do know that it's different than February 2020. And so it's very important as we think about how we shape and shift our businesses that we do it consistent with succeeding in that new environment. Um, if there is one takeaway that I think is really important for us to leave with this presentation, it's that the time to begin is now. Unfortunately, uh, time is the enemy uh, with regards to um, making the necessary shifts to make your business as productive and successful as possible. Uh, next slide, Susan. So the absolute lifeblood of any organization, particularly in a distressed time or a very challenging time like today, is cash flow. 
cash and the conservation of it really needs to be your first, second, and third priorities. One thing I think that's really important to recognize is that outside of these government stimulus programs, most of the traditional funding sources, banks in particular, are unlikely to lend in this environment um, to the people that absolutely need it. Um, by and large, you know, they, they're a business themselves. They need to worry about uh, managing their credit risks. And this is not a time where they're very likely to go and um, to be very aggressive from a risk standpoint in terms of extending credit. Therefore, you need to operate assuming that you're getting no incremental capital infusion. Um, and so it's absolutely essential for you to manage your cash efficiently and to stretch it as long as possible. And that's really by prioritizing the different needs that you have from a cash standpoint um, and uh, making sure that the absolute most essential things are taken care of, but delaying um, or having discussions about potentially rejiggering some of the commitments um, in, in some of the less uh, important categories, or at least the less urgent categories. So uh, going to the next slide, here we're basically seeing uh, the two major levers when we talk about uh, finding cash, right? We discussed before that it's unlikely that we're going to get infusion of cash from the outside, at least not easily and not quickly. So the first one is reducing your cash outflows. Uh, these are basic things like reducing cash expenses, and we'll get into in detail what are some of the tactics you can do to identify where there's opportunities to reduce costs. Um, there's other things like stretching out your accounts payables. Normally, you may pay immediately if you can pay um, at, the, uh, at, at the due date or stretching it out. Um, suspending, at least temporarily, any types of capital expenditures or longer-term projects that are not going to have an immediate ROI. And if you really need to, negotiating forbearances with your lease payments, your loans, even insurance payments often um, are, are offering forbearance periods for up to 90 days for companies that are hard hit by this COVID um, disaster. In terms of the other side of the house, we want to try to accumulate and capture as much cash as possible. So first and foremost, if you have availability in your line of credit, drawing from it would be a source of cash. Um, accelerating your receivables. So making sure that you stay on top of those receivables that are outstanding, particularly anything that is um, past due. You may even want to consider, for example, uh, extending discounts or incentives for people to pay early. Uh, there's other sources like depleting or selling your inventory or non-essential assets. Um, and there's creative opportunities of attempting new business models that could generate cash inflow, particularly for businesses that may be, uh, for, for lockdown purposes, not able to generate any revenue in their current manifestation. We'll talk about a couple of um, really inspirational things later in, in today. And lastly is raising capital. Um, Capital, external capital obviously is, is, is a resource. One thing going back to the theme that it's a very important to start early is that what I'm hearing from both banks and private investors is that capital, uh, the process to raise it and the due diligence period is being extended often up to double the length of time that was uh, the norm pre-coronavirus. So it's really important that if these are things that you think that you're gonna need to do, that you start early, because every day that you delay uh, taking these actions is burning precious cash. So with that, I'm going to be turning it over to Ramiro, who's going to provide you a number of perspectives, really from a bank president's uh, perspective, of how to have a conversation that's constructive and appropriate um, if you're having issues. Next slide, please. Thank you, David. Um... I'd like to uh, begin my presentation with just piling on a little bit to what David said. Uh, David gave you a lot of recommendations on how to preserve cash. Well, make sure that you understand that other people just like us are making the same recommendations to some of your own uh, clients and customers. Uh, so 
said another way, the pressure is on uh, both sides. Um, let me talk a little bit about the conversations, pleasant or unpleasant, that you'll have with bankers uh, as this situation plays out and give you some recommendations on do's and don'ts. I want to start out with the don't. Uh, when I say don't avoid calls, uh, I went through the 0809 real estate crisis, the 2000, 1999 uh, tech bubble crash, the late 80s uh, SNL crisis that resulted in a commercial real estate crisis. So I've been through several of these downturns and recessions. And the one thing that used to bother me tremendously was the client who was avoiding the call. What do I mean by that? You call up the client, you know the client's got problems. All of a sudden, the, your call is returned at 1245 when he knows good and well you're having lunch. And as soon as you get back, you call him up and nothing. And then first thing in the morning when you come in, you've got a message that says, Romero, it's so-and-so, I just called you back. It's quarter after nine, and you're playing this silly game. Don't avoid that. When that would go on, I would always ask myself the question, what question am I going to ask so-and-so that he doesn't want to or she doesn't want to answer? So avoid the telephone tag situation. Uh, when you are communicating, don't misrepresent anything. It's only a matter of time until the banker learns what the actual situation is. My experience is that the earlier you and the banker jointly confront the reality of where you're at, the better the chances for some creative solutions. Um, another pet peeve, and I know Jay Pelham can relate to this, is don't trickle the bad news. Uh, I want you to understand the chain that goes on at the bank. Your banker has a credit administration department or a credit administrator or a senior lender that they need to go through. That banker is gonna be advocating your position. He or she will spend capital with that credit administrator or credit director to put together something that will work. And then if he or she comes back to you and then he gets the, oh, but I forgot to tell you that we also have this situation, then that banker has now lost a lot of credibility with his credit administrator or with his senior lender, and therefore you've lost credibility in their eyes and it makes the whole process uh, a lot more difficult. Let's talk about the do's. Do communicate with your lender. This is the time for over communication. I promise you that it'll be welcomed by your lender. Uh, and what does he wanna talk about? He wants to talk about, or she wants to talk about specifics, cash flow, debt service coverage, liquidity, and we'll get into more in a little bit. Uh, and be transparent and be brutally honest with where you're at. Again, the sooner that you confront the reality with your banker, the better off you're going to both be. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that not with a howdy duty call, but with a real actual financial plan. Next slide, Susan, please. Now, I don't mean for you to go through line item by line item, but what you see in the categories here, it's very easy. What your banker wants to see is a projection of the cash coming in, a projection of the cash going out. What does that do to the debt service coverage of your loan? What's the status of your payables and your receivables? And then the status of your liquidity. Now, I'm going to, and these projections have to be very realistic. I'm gonna walk you through two different scenarios. Scenario number one, banker approaches you, how's it going? Oh, it's going well, but you know, it's things are a little bit tough now with this coronavirus thing, but we're gonna get through it. We've been through tough times together and we've gotten through it. That call is meaningless. Here is what the banker is looking for. How's it going? Well, it's going, it's, it's, things are a little bit trying. Uh, as we project our numbers out, uh, we've got three covenants that will be tested December 31st. Two of those covenants we should meet. The third one, EBIT uh, to debt service coverage, uh, the covenant calls for 1.25. 
as our projections start, uh, as our projections stand today, we would be coming in around 1.20. Now, we've got some levers in this financial plan. If by late August, early September, we're not at a predefined benchmark, which is in your plan uh, that you're presenting, then our game plan is to reduce expenses here and there. And here and there are places that we think are important and we'd rather not touch, but we've got some room to do that. If we reduce expenses by X there, that'll get that covenant up to around 1.21, 1.22. Now, generally in the fall, that's our peak season. Generally, our revenue goes up 14 to 16%. That's our historical number. In our projection, we're taking that down to 6%. If we can get a 6% increase, then our projected debt service coverage will be somewhere around 1.23, 1.24. So we may miss it, but we'll miss it by one or two basis points. Now that conversation had some real meat and potatoes that the banker can really, really track and follow. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, if it comes to restructuring, there are a number of options that are available. But the first thing that I want you to understand, and I've heard this a number of times, is from the perspective of the borrower, the conversation starts with, I've got issues. Well, it shouldn't be I've got issues, it's we've got issues. Because the scenario that you need to convince the lender of is work with me, because we're both better off. Let's come together with a win-win where we're both better off. And that may call for some additional collateral on your part. In turn, the banker then would modify the loan, but it's got to be a give and take. Again, when I go back to recessions, it used to upset me when the quote, the modification, the restructure, the interest only, the forbearance, whatever it was that the borrower would propose was always skin off my hide as I would ask him, well, what are you giving? Uh, you've got an example. You've got a nice little farm in Ocala that's got equity. How about you give us a second position on that? Oh, no, I won't do that. Well, understand that you're taking the entrepreneurial risk, not the banker. The banker does not get paid enough to take an entrepreneurial risk. The business model for the banker is very simple. I'm going to rent you money. You pay me back principal and interest. If you multiply that times 50, wonderful. That means a bigger line next year. If you multiply that by two, let's see how we can get it higher. But the banker, a mistake that a lot of people make is I hear, the banker doesn't want to take the risk. Well, you're right. The banker does not want to take the entrepreneurial risk that you're taking. Because the banker simply doesn't get compensated for that. Also, you might expect going forward, we've been in a fairly loose credit environment. You might expect some tightening of credit as we go forward. Next slide, please. Now comes the heavy lifting. Uh, depending on the level of turnaround that you need to do, there are some difficult decisions that need to be made. The point is that you can't procrastinate on the difficult decisions. A way that I have learned over the years that works best is to take your entire picture of stakeholders, not just yourself, but the entire pictures of stakeholders. That is my creditors, my suppliers, my employees, my clients. What works best for the greater good? Uh, but rapid change is the word here. Uh, while while you're in the state of turnaround, be guilty of over-communicating again with your employees, with your suppliers, with your clients. Uh, now's the time that you as a leader, you need to be visible. What I learned over the years is that the more difficult the situation is, the bigger the smile needs to be on your face. Your behavior will tell a lot to your employees, suppliers, creditors, etc about how confident you are or may not be in your turnaround. Next slide, please. 
it's very fashionable now and very timely to talk about reducing expenses. And that's unfortunately part of the heavy lifting that we need to do as leaders. The advice that I would give you on that, and I've heard a number of times now, we're making a 20% cut across the board. We're making a 25% cut across the board. And that, from my perspective, is exactly what you should not be doing. Now is not the time to take a sledgehammer, but rather a scalpel. And what do you do? Now, now, you need to do a real honest to goodness, goodness assessment of activity. What's the activity that's taking place in your enterprise? And of those activities, because all activity has a price, right? So of all of those activities, which activities are essential to the ongoing business and which activities are nice to have that were important a couple of years ago, but are not so important today. And I would put this thought in your head as you're looking at reducing expenses is I'm not laying off people or furloughing people, but rather I'm laying off activities. And that can only come by a thorough review of every single activity that you do in your company. Next slide. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm gonna turn it back over to David for David to wrap it up. Thanks, Ramiro. So Ramiro talked a lot about expense reductions, <clears throat> but there are some areas that actually it makes sense to strategically invest incremental dollars in because without uh, the, the management of these risks, you could actually tank your business, right? They, they have such a, a dramatic impact on your ability to operate that it's not worth uh, shortchanging the investment. The first is cybersecurity. Um, unfortunately, cyber criminals have in this environment escalated their numbers of attacks. Romero and I have heard of a number of different business owners in this environment that have recently been um, extorted and unfortunately had to pay some very large ransom uh, payouts. And so particularly in this environment, you cannot afford to resolve a cyber, a cyber attack. Uh, whatever uh, investments that you need to do to make sure, particularly with people working from home, uh, to harden the infrastructure, I'd encourage you to take a serious look at. Um, secondly is an overexposure to limited suppliers. So uh, not all suppliers are equally as important or equally um, as, as common, but most people, most businesses have exposure to certain vendors that uh, there's not a lot of alternatives. And so it's very important during these difficult uh, times that you keep a very close pulse on how your suppliers are doing, because if they were to go under, you would then miss a critical component which would prevent you from being able to deliver uh, to your customers. So what we recommend is stocking up on mission critical inventory, even if it's not technically efficient, um, if you suspect that there's some risks or if you suspect that there'll be some stockouts, um, and, and definitely identify alternative suppliers and develop relationships with them immediately. Lastly, on the credit risk side, this is definitely an area where um, it's very important to, to have um, a cautious stance. Many of your customers will be uh, in a financially difficult position and you need to uh, really make sure that you're translating revenue into actual cash flow. So for customers that you think are in a vulnerable position, uh, I'd encourage you to consider demanding payment upfront. Uh, other possibilities that may be a little bit more expensive but will reduce your risk exposure are, um, for example, accepting credit cards and encouraging people to use that. Yes, you pay fees on it, but you don't have the underlying credit risk, which would be potentially catastrophic um, for you from your own cash flow perspective. Next slide, please, Susan. So the, the goal of this slide, everybody has seen the, the financial um, metrics and uh, rates that are out there. Um, the reality is whatever the numbers are, they're not pretty. Um, the goal here is not to scare you, but just to um, shine light on the reality, which is when we exit 
from this virus and whatever exit truly means, we are going to be in what is likely going to be a recessionary environment for some period of time, hopefully a relatively short amount of time. But it means that you have to operate your business uh, with that in mind, right? You need to think about how do I continue to sell? How do I continue to be profitable when uh, the demand is likely going to be less than February 2020? Next slide. And so on a similar note, I think it's really important to think about what has changed in your industry, what has changed in society. Um, there are things that will likely never go back the, to the same um, from before. Uh, for example, the acceleration of e-commerce, I believe, is something of which uh, is likely to continue to occur at the expense of traditional retail. Um, at least over the near term, the restrictions of travel and mobility are likely to be with us. And so... I'm sure whatever your specific industry is, that there's going to be uh, specific changes or disruptions to your industry. It's really important, going back to the original analogy of skating to where the puck is going, that you identify how is the world going to be different? What is the needs uh, that my customers are going to have? And how can I most efficiently and effectively address those needs? That is what is going to determine who's going to be successful in this environment, and who, unfortunately, is not. Next slide, please. And so I want to end on a positive note. In every crisis, there is opportunity. Um, and probably one of the best analogies to our current situation is prohibition. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, prohibition was in the 1920s when the federal government overnight uh, made the sale of alcohol illegal. And so you had at one point a thousand breweries and distilleries that all of a sudden their business model was illegal overnight. At the end of prohibition, um, 150 of those uh, thousand survived. Many of our biggest uh, beer brands today came from that period. So the question is, what did they do? How did they survive and ultimately thrive to be the big companies that they are today? And it was through innovation and resourcefulness, which to me is, is, is inspirational, right? Uh, Yunling, as you see in the, in the bottom uh, corner picture, actually went into ice cream and dairy. Other guys went into selling other types of foods like meat. There were actually others like Schmitz that went into near beer, basically alcohol-free beer, and various other business models. And I see every day in um, the various you know, newspaper publications, stories of really innovative uh, owners that unfortunately were hit really hard with COVID, but took this as an opportunity to find uh, the pockets of, of need. So for example, I've read about uh, business owners that had an events management company. Clearly a lot of that uh, was put on pause, but quickly shifted into COVID, um, COVID testing and providing the logistical and operational infrastructure for doing that. The reality is that while they may not be um, widely publicized, there's a number of business owners that are successfully navigating this. And uh, the, the reality is we need to play uh, the current situation as it, as it lies. Um, there's opportunities in every environment and it just takes the, um, the mindset and uh, the creativity to take advantage of it. With that, I want to turn it over to, to Jay. Hopefully, as you innovate and you do really well, um, you know, the, the, the tactics that he's providing will help you maximize um, both the preservation and, and generation of, of wealth. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ramiro. So had I known that they would finish their segment on prohibition, the opportunities, I would have started my segment on a uh, how to on how to make moonshine while you're at home uh, during the pandemic. Um, but we'll do it differently. Susan, if you don't mind, if you could bring the presentation up. So like Ramiro, I'm living proof that there is life after banking. After a 30 year career in banking, um, I've joined Kaufman Rawson and I'm a principal in the firm and I lead Kaufman Rawson Wealth, a registered investment advisor. I'm here in my speech. Is 
There we go. And are you able to hear me at this point? We, we can hear you. Okay, so you can hear me, good, okay. So, after a 30 year career in banking, specializing in private banking and wealth management, I've joined Kaufman Ralston Wealth. I lead Kaufman Ralston Wealth, the registered investment advisory firm, as well as Kaufman Ralston Insurance Services, an independent agent. I do have two colleagues that are helping us behind the scenes today, uh, Charles Sachs uh, from Kaufman Ralston Wealth and Jared Kornfeld from Kaufman Ralston Insurance. From time to time, they may be dropping in links or information into the chat, and I'd like to thank them in advance for their support. If we can move to the next slide, Susan. And let's go to the next one. So if you don't mind, take a few moments. I need to check the box for compliance so I don't get in trouble with Charles. And uh, take a moment and read our disclaimer. Okay, Susan, next slide. So what are we gonna do today? So our agenda. A uh, lot's happened in the last few months, and I think Alfred touched on this at the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a great many people in the world that have had their physical health impacted. A, a lot of people have had their mental health impacted, and most likely, there's a fair number that have had their financial health impacted. And while I'm not a medical doctor, and I'm not a psychiatrist, although I feel like I am some days, I do consider myself a financial physician of sorts. So today we're gonna to give you a little bit of perspective on what's been happening and guide us on how to get financial treatment for your personal investments, as well as well spend a little time on life insurance uh, in today's environment. Next slide. So this is an appropriate uh, visual here. Um, the world's walking down the sidewalk and this a coronavirus just comes around the corner and just smacks us right out of the middle of nowhere. Uh, next slide. So the cartoon there, uh, that's a picture of me at the office. Uh, I'm in the blue suit. Uh, you can't tell me because I'm wearing a mask. That's Charles on the right. And if we look at these headlines, they're all over the place. Uh, we start uh, down at the bottom of the page, beginning of May. We've got a uh, low level of volatility, and then we move to outlook is highly uncertain. Then cracks emerge again, and then a rally. If we could go to the next slide. So same thing here. We, we start at the bottom there in, in April. Stocks rise as Fed pledges support. Tech stocks pull lower. Another rally. Stocks accelerate again, and I think we've all been following the headlines since all of this. And um, you know, the markets had a strong recovery, and uh, you know, a lot going on there. Next slide, please. So, unfortunately, this is not our first pandemic. Uh, we look at this slide. We see in modern history, we had the Asian flu in the 1950s with two million deaths the Hong Kong flu in the 60s with a million deaths. And uh, fortunately, as time progressed, the number of deaths has, has declined. But one of these, one thing that all of these pandemics had in common is they all had a negative impact on the stock market. And there was also a recovery in each case. So uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not in um, unprecedented times in some respects and that we have had pandemics. Uh, next slide. So when we hear about the market going up, the market going down, what we're really talking about is the share price of the stocks that are within a particular index and how those stocks are moving in tandem. Um, and not every stock moves up when the market goes up and not every stock moves down. And uh, the way these stock prices are impacted is basically based upon all available information that's out there. So if you think about the internet today and newspapers and media and television, all of that information impacts the share price. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that it moves very rapidly. Here's an example of an announcement that was made Valentine's Day in 2013. 
um, that Berkshire Hathaway was going to acquire Heinz. And if you can see the same day the announcement is made, huge increase in the stock price. That's in the, the upper chart. Then in the lower chart, you see the trading volume uh, goes up significantly. So news travels fast. It, it's impacting share price quickly. And it's usually forward looking, not backward looking. If we could go to the next slide, please. And if we look, there have been other crises that have affected the stock market, not just medical situations such as epidemics. And if we start on the left hand side of the page and go across, you've got the stock market crash of 87, the SNL crisis moving along the dot com crash September 11th. Um, all of these impacted the market. And by the way, in this particular example, this is an example of a balanced portfolio, meaning that it's 60% stocks and 40% bonds. And, and because of the 40% bonds, this particular portfolio example doesn't have nearly as much volatility as if it was all stocks. And if you look in each of these cases, you had a year later, you had an increase, two years later, three years later. So uh, the market is resilient, the market recovers, um, but it can be bumpy along the way. Next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, this is a slide that really talks about how human beings are wired to do the exact opposite of what they should be doing as markets evolve. And if we look uh, down on the left where it says optimism and follow that up to elation, think about that as a uh, increasing stock market where the market's rising. And that means the price of all those shares of stock are going up. And this is the time that human beings are wired to not miss out on something, uh, FOMO as we call it. So, People are rushing into the market because they hear things are doing well. And I, I say this is the example, this would be as if my wife called me one day and said, hey, the place where I go buy shoes, and she loves to buy shoes, they're going to raise the prices of all the shoes in the store, so let's rush out there and go buy more of them. It just doesn't make any sense. But it is the natural human emotional thing to do. And then what happens if you follow elation down to nervousness, let's say that's a declining market. And then when it goes down further, then that's when really people should be buying, but it's often when they're selling. So this is just a visual to describe how human emotion actually works against us in a, in a situation like the evolving stock market. The next slide, please. So this is an interesting way of um, putting some numbers to that. If you look on the far right, that, that represents treasury bills. So let's suppose back in 1990, you invested $1,000 in treasury bills. In 2018, 28 years later, that $1,000 will have a little bit more than doubled. And uh, that would be $2,188. And let's go back to the far left. If you had invested that $1,000 in the S&P 500 index, that $1,000 would have grown to $13,000. Now, what that means, though, is you would have invested that $1,000, and through every crash, through every correction, you left it in there. And these bars that are in between, missed one best day, missed five single days, and so on, those are examples of if someone tried to time the market, and during that 28-year period, they missed just one the best day. Well, that would brought, bring their return on investment from 13,000 down to 11,000 and change. And if they missed just the five best days down to 8,700 and so forth. So missing only a few days of strong returns can drastically impact performance. And this is why they, there's a saying, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. The next slide, please.
So this is another example of how um, how different crises will affect the market and how writing it out can often reward the discipline. So I won't walk through all of these, but if you look, this is from 1970 to 2018. And uh, it shows $1 invested in 1970, if you stuck with it all the way to 2018, it would be worth $54. And, but you have to write out all the troughs all the difficult times, which a lot of people have a tough time with. Next slide, please. So who's this guy standing here lost in a field with an old fashioned map? So we've, this has been what we'll call it up until now, the class for, classroom portion of our session and now what do we do with this information? Well, you need to get a game plan. That's the most important thing. Next slide. So let's talk about getting an advisor and what makes a good advisor. So I would start with someone that's got strong qualifications and credentials. So someone that's say a CFP, for example, that's a certified financial planner. They've gone through rigorous training. I went through 18 months of courses had to pass a national examination and have to get ongoing continuing education every year. And it covers a variety of materials that helps you plan someone's personal financial picture. CFA is Chartered Financial Analyst. Uh, that's a credential that gets into more granular detail on investments. Uh, my colleague, Charles Sachs, he's a lot smarter than I am. He's both a CFP and a CFA. And CDFA, is a certified divorce financial analyst. So there's actually a credential for someone that specializes in helping people that are either going through or have just been through a divorce. And there's many different types of credentials. Uh, and the thing is just ask questions. Uh, you know, ask what kind of qualifications your advisor would bring to the table. I know this sounds basic, but someone who's a good listener. The person that you go to meet with that immediately starts making recommendations for you and hasn't asked you any questions to learn about you, well, they're not gonna give you a good plan because they're gonna be pulling out some kind of one size fits all plan. Transparency and fees and compensation. Uh, this is a regulated business, but not all regulators are the same. And as a registered investment advisor, I'm required to be transparent in my fees and how I'm compensated, but um, there's other business models where you're not and look for someone who's the right fit for you. So if you've got $200,000 to invest and the person you're talking to says their average account size is $10 million, you might not be a good fit for them. Conversely, if you've got millions of dollars and their average account size is 200,000, you're not a good fit for that person either. And, you know, sometimes people want to be sure it's a local person. Uh, you know, we've done a lot remotely and, uh, COVID has allowed us to highly develop our Zoom skills, but sometimes it's important to have someone that understands your market and where you live and what your neighborhoods and what your town is like. Next slide, please. So um, we've talked about hiring an advisor and some people are going, well, gee, you know, this is gonna cost me something and uh, our advisor's expensive. And many of you are probably familiar with Vanguard and Vanguard is a well-respected low-cost mutual fund provider. And Vanguard actually does a study, it's called Advisor Alpha, that quantifies the incremental value for having an advisor. And they actually quantify it in three major categories. And they say, okay, portfolio construction, and that would be working on someone's asset allocation to have the right mix of stocks and bonds. That could add a little bit more than 1% to someone's return. Behavioral coaching, that would be withdrawal strategies, spend down strategies, asset location strategies, um, that could add as much as a point and a half. And then wealth management practices, which are active rebalancing, uh, tax loss harvesting, could be almost another one and a half points. And in their end analysis, that by having an advisor, 
after paying that advisor's fee, the expectation is it's going to add as much as 3% to your return on average per year. Next slide. So let's also talk, we talked about what type of advisor, why that advisor is important, why it's worthwhile to invest in the cost of that advisor. So let's talk about elements of the good financial plan. So we talked about having a good advisor and an advisor would be like a doctor. And if you went into a doctor's office and that person immediately started prescribing things to you without learning anything about your situation, you'd probably get up and walk out of there because you'd probably say, gee, this isn't a good doctor. Well, an advisor, they should ask questions, a lot of questions. They should learn about your situation. So their plan that they recommend or the plan that you develop together addresses your situation. You should create goals, goals like I'd like to retire in so many years. I'd like to spend so much money each year in my retirement. I'd like to accumulate um, uh, um, so much in education spending. The plan should be developed based upon your goals and your risk profile. At Kaufman Ross and Wealth, we actually give a risk test to our prospective clients to help quantify what their risk tolerance is. The plan should be documented. If someone says, hey, we're going to develop you a plan and you never actually see a plan and you actually, actually never see the, how they're going to invest your money, uh, I'd be concerned. And just like in Ramirez's example about being a borrower talking with your banker, your advisor should be talking to you on an ongoing basis about your financial situation. Next slide. So we've identified on the CFP website, which is uh, www.letsmakeaplan.org, they list out 10 questions that you should ask your advisor. And we've already talked about qualifications and credentials and experience, but the third one, what services do you offer? Uh, there are some advisors that only prepare plans. There are some advisors that prepare plans and manage money. There are some advisors that either directly or through an affiliate have access to insurance solutions. There are some that are embedded in an accounting firm like Kaufman Ross and Wealth, where you can have access uh, to tax planning and estate planning and other services. So good question to ask. What is your approach to financial planning? What types of clients do you work with? These are all good questions. Will you be the only advisor working with me? Do you have a team of people? Do you have a third party that you partner with to, for additional support? Back to the transparency on expenses, how will I pay for your service? In line with how much will I pay? How do you charge? Do others stand to gain from the financial advice? And this last one, have you ever been publicly disciplined for any unlawful or unethical actions in your career? There are people in the industry that have had disciplinary issues and uh, you should know about that if you're going to consider working with that person. All good questions again on letsmakeaplan.org. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna transition and talk a little bit about life insurance. And during this pandemic, uh, we've actually seen uh, very much heightened interest in life insurance by the clients that we work with. I think people uh, generally feel maybe more of a sense of mortality during a pandemic, and they also tend to have more time on their hands to reflect on uh, their planning. And, and these sometimes were people that started a plan for insurance and didn't finish it, and uh, we're working with a lot of those folks. And if we go to the next slide, so most of us care about being sure we have the right life insurance in place and what does it cost us? And there's three main factors that influence the cost of life insurance, meaning what the premium is. The first is medical underwriting. So does someone have a heart condition? Does someone have high blood pressure? Does someone have any type of medical condition that could impact their life expectancy? Now, what we've seen over the years is medical conditions that might have increased a premium in the past, maybe don't do so anymore now that there's a treatment for it. Now, if there's high blood pressure medicine that someone can take, 
uh, that might not be something that increases the premium uh, on their uh, application. Mortality, meaning life expectancy. If someone is 22 years old, uh, barring some type of medical condition, they have many more years for the insurance company to invest that premium than someone, say, who's 70 years old. So the number of years of life expectancy influences the cost of the insurance. And interest rates, um, in general, influence the premium cost. What we've seen, uh, what we've seen is that right now interest rates are impacting the cost of life insurance more than medical underwriting or mortality. Uh, we're in an extremely low interest rate environment, which means as the rates have declined, the insurance companies have had difficulty in projecting out how they could invest those premiums over the long term. So ironically, in a, in a medical pandemic, because we're in, it's interest rates that are most affecting the insurance cost. If we go to the next slide, please. So shopping for life insurance. So here's a car turn here that says, uh, um, you know, when I die, they'll send you a lottery ticket. Well, there are better ways to shop for life insurance than buying a lottery ticket. Um, for one example, you could go online and uh, there's lots of different sites, but you will get absolutely no guidance, uh, no advice, and you're completely on your own. You could go directly to an insurance company and that sounds better and is better, but in some cases that insurance agent that works at that company would only offer products that their company sells. So you don't get access to the full market. The third way in which we think is the best way is someone who's an independent agent and that they can access the products or solutions of many different life insurance companies. Next slide. So this is an example of the results from an independent agent searching the marketplace to get a policy for a 70 year old male that was looking for a, a million dollar permanent life insurance policy that was part of his estate plan. Now we won't spend time getting off on a tangent about estate planning, but uh, let's just say that it made economic sense for this person to insure part of their projected cost of estate taxes and have an insurance policy in place to cover that. And uh, what the independent agent did is went out and shopped the entire marketplace of all the different providers out there to see what were the results that they could come back with. Now it was the exact same medical information used with every one of these companies. So they didn't get different medical reports. It was the same information. All these companies are either A or A plus rated, meaning they're very strong insurance companies. And as you can see at the bottom of the chart, Protective Life in this example said, you know what? We don't think this person's a good risk for us. We're going to decline offering them coverage altogether. So uh, insurance companies can do that. They can take an application to say, you know what, we're going to take a pass and we're not going to offer them insurance at all. Principal National looked at this person and said, you know what, we're prepared to do this, but we're going to rate them a table four, which means we're rating them at a much higher risk than average. And the annual premiums will be almost $65,000 a year. And PAC Life in this case, looked at the same person, same medical report, and rank them a preferred risk with a premium less than half of what Principal National is. Now, please don't take away from this that Principal National is an expensive company and Pack Life is an inexpensive company because we could very easily go shop for someone next week and all of these names would be in, in a completely different order. It's based upon the conditions at that time. It's based upon uh, factors within the company at that time and it's based upon where they are in uh, implementing any price changes based upon interest rates and other factors. And this, uh, in my view, illustrates the very strong value of having an independent agent that's going to go shop many different companies. Next slide. So why do people get life insurance? Income replacement is, is a, often a need that people have. If you've got a couple that has two incomes to support a household uh, and they need both incomes to support that household. Uh, you've got college education that's gonna be funded over time, other things like that. 
if you lose one of those incomes, it could be a problem. So the life insurance policy would give you a lump sum payment to be able to replace that income. Debt repayment. Uh, again, a couple that has a house together, has a mortgage on that house, it needs both incomes to pay the mortgage. They might get an insurance policy that if something were to happen to one of them that they could pay down or pay off that mortgage. Uh, estate and legacy planning. Uh, legacy planning would be someone that's decided I want to leave money to a charity and I'm going to use it by way of a life insurance policy. Estate planning would be someone who's got a taxable estate and it makes sense for them to pay some of those estate taxes upon their death with an insurance policy as opposed to using some of the estate. And there's a variety of needs for closely held businesses, um, executive bonus plans, key, key person insurance. What we're seeing a lot more of are people that are interested in funding buy sell agreements. And imagine you've got an engineering firm that's got uh, two business partners in that firm and they own a 50-50. And let's suppose each of those engineers are married to lawyers. And so each of them have a, has a significant other that's a lawyer. If something happens to one of those engineers and there's not a buy-sell agreement and an insurance policy in place, you could wind up having the engineer having the lawyer as the partner in their business. And they might not uh, be happy about having a, a lawyer helping them run an engineering firm. Uh, the lawyer probably isn't happy about having to work at an engineering firm that they now own half of. So a lot of times that's covered through a properly structured by sell agreement where either the company or the two partners own life insurance policies on each other. Next slide, please. So people say sometimes, why does any of this matter if I already own life insurance? If you could keep clicking, I think there's some more that will come up on this. Circumstances change and goals evolve. You've got to, uh, from time to time, look at the ownership structure and your beneficiaries. And statistically speaking, what we found is more than two thirds of the time, we're able to replace an existing policy with a superior policy, meaning one that provides additional benefits and or at a lower cost. Um, so just because you have insurance doesn't mean you're stuck with that life insurance policy forever. It always makes sense to have someone review that to see if you can, first of all, do you have the right kind of coverage? And even if you do, can you get that coverage at a lower price? And then sometimes this happens. Next slide. Looks like Audrey Hepburn there. We've seen cases where someone applied for coverage years ago when they were a smoker and they've since quit smoking, and but they're still paying the smoker rates. They can reapply, get a new policy and save a lot of money. We've actually seen cases where it's a business where there's a key person, and when the bank made a loan to the business, they required a life insurance policy on that key person, and the loan has since been paid off, but it's still assigned to the bank. Um, somewhere in the shuffle, they forgot to release it. Um, you need to check your policies periodically. And we've actually even seen a case where someone had a term policy that the term period ran out, and meaning that the the period for which they had a fixed premium expired and then it converted to a policy that could go up every year and for in this case seven or eight years they paid a higher premium every single year and they never noticed it it was being debited to an account they just kind of saw yeah that's the insurance payment and we were able to replace that with a policy uh, that brought their their cost down significantly so another example Next slide. So remember this guy lost in the field with the old paper map. We want to move you to the kind of person that has the right advisor and the right plan can help you get to where you want to go. Um, and that's all that I have today. So thank you everyone. And I guess I'll turn it over to Alfred and see if we have any questions. Thank you, Jay. And, uh, Thanks, Ramiro and David. Great, great presentation. We do have several questions. I'm going to start out um, with uh, with you, uh, David and Ramiro, because I think what we want to start out with is uh, organizationally, people are really facing some uh, some troubled times. Um, many businesses, you know, are they're they're looking, they're kind of drinking from a fire hose. They're looking at simultaneous fires everywhere, and uh, there's some questions to wh where do you begin? Where, wh where, where is the closest alligator? How do you determine that? 
David, let me turn that over to you and Ramiro. Uh, well, um, it's a matter of prioritization. Uh, the first thing that you need to look at is where are my main revenue drivers and where am I spending my money? And you've got to make sure that there's alignment, which most of the time there isn't, by the way, that there is alignment between what's driving your expenses and what's driving your revenue. And by focusing on the activities that are associated with both revenue drivers and expense driver, you've got to get those aligned. And if you think in that manner, um, then you can you usually make the right decision. What I would encourage folks not to do, as I said earlier in the presentation, is the across the board uh, expense reduction but rather aligning sources of expenses with sources of revenue and the fluff that's outside those parameters, that's what I would prioritize in terms of eliminating. And just to piggyback on that, I think it's also important to look at your financials and to rank order your largest expenses down to the smallest ones and to really start with the biggest and, and ideally the easiest ones first um, so looking at it in that construct also is, is very helpful. Just a follow-up question on that, because I think a lot of the, a lot of businesses, um, as I think David, you, you brought it up that, uh, the whole idea of, uh, making, um, ice cream instead of booze. So a lot of businesses are, are pivoting or turning to new lines of services. And I want to ask you, you know, how, how do you go about, uh, determining how do you, cut costs while shifting some of the cost over to a new line of business. So what, what are the, some of the things that a business should be thinking about when they're doing that? I guess I'll start and, and you know, Ramiro can, can then chime in. I think it's really important first just to, um, to identify what exactly um, is what the, what the future is going to look like in that business opportunity. Um, and then when, when you have that strategy, then you can have your, your processes and your organizational structure aligned to executing on it, right? Um, but I think particularly given the uncertainty of both COVID and, and quite frankly, what will work and where the demand is, I think it's very important for people to have a very agile mindset, meaning they iterate and they continually test where there's um, an opportunity as quickly and as cheaply as possible so that they're certain that the actual opportunities exist, right? Because it's very easy on paper to say, oh, we can do X, Y, Z, and we can make a lot of money. Um, but that may run, um, you know, right into the reality, which is there's, there's some, you know, little catches that, that you didn't think about, right? Alfred, I, I think that, uh, that the situation that you just discussed uh, is probably the most dangerous cycle for a business because what you're suggesting is what your question is as you're pivoting away from your main line of business or from an alternative line of business what do you do and companies that i've consulted with uh, as we talk about pivoting sometimes you need to pivot but the question i always ask is are we betting the farm on the pivot and if the answer is yes then you've got to really, really, really rationalize the pivot and analyze the risk factors for the pivot. Sometimes you may have no choice, but the question that I always ask is, are we betting the farm? And if the answer is yes, what are the safety points that we need to put to make sure that if the bet is the wrong bet, we haven't completely lost the farm? But it is the most dangerous point in a business cycle. There you go. That's a great point, Ramiro. I think that's a, a, a very great uh, question for, for all of us because I think even Chambers are, are doing the same thing. I did fail to um, uh, introduce my colleague, Dan Lindblade, who's the CEO of the uh, Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce. And I know that we have a lot of uh, board members from the South Florida Business Council. I want to welcome everybody. And Dan, just chime in when if, if you have a follow-up or, you know, uh, or any other question as well. Um, just following alongside the 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 uh, you know how, how how do you align your resources? A lot of the companies are downsizing, um, and and 
you know, there's, there's in this time period, there's a lot of things to keep in, in mind. So Ramiro and David and Jay, gosh, if you have some insight of this, uh, lot, you know, you've got a lot of years of management here. What, what, what would your best uh, response be to how do you do that in a careful uh, way that, that really doesn't leave your business worse than it was when you first started that? Well, you know, a couple of thoughts um, as, as different clients that I talk to, the very first thing that I suggest is remember that there will be life after COVID-19. And people will remember what you did or you didn't do during this crisis. And what you want to be very sensitive to is that you don't alienate your top, top performers and they may swallow what you're doing during this crisis, but guess what? There is life after COVID-19. And you don't want to put the company in a position where when things settle down and the economy recovers, your top performers will have options and choices while your mediocre performers will not. And you don't want to lose your top performers because things you did in a panic mode during the crisis may not have been the best decisions and you're left with mediocre performers. Earlier in my presentations, I talked about analyzing activity in your company. Does this business directly contribute to revenue or directly contribute to an expense reduction? Or is it something that just from a compliance government standpoint I need to do? If that activity doesn't fall in any of those three buckets, you've got to eliminate it. But your mindset and what you've got to communicate is I'm eliminating the activity, not the person. And this is the time then that maybe you reshuffle and reallocate resources. Uh, but this is where you've got to seriously look at the talent management program in your company. And what you don't want to do is lay off your A performers uh, and be left with a company full of C performers. Yeah. David, do you, you know, want to Alfred, I would, I would add something to, to, to what Ramiro was saying, and, and I would take it in the context of working with your bank. And, and so I'm going to take off my wealth hat and my insurance hat and put on my advisor hat as a partner in the firm. Uh, you know, just for example, we had a lot of companies at the beginning of this that called us up and said, should I go draw down my entire line of credit with my bank? You know, cash is important. I, I should draw the whole thing out, right? And, and my response, uh, based upon my background, was you need to play the long game. And, and the short game, it sounds good to go draw out all your money, but uh, you're going to need to go work with that banker again at some point. And that banker is going to say, well, if you had already had cash in the bank, you already had receivables you could collect, your business was operating, you know, did you really need to do this? Uh, and I've even heard people that said, Go draw the money out and then go put it in a different bank than the bank where you're the borrower. And, and you probably have the ability as the borrower to do all those things, but it's going to um, probably create a, an uncomfortable conversation a month later, three months later, six months later at the end of the calendar year when you're working with that bank. Uh, you know, keep the lines of communication open. And remember, there's a short game that we need to get through, but then there's a long game that we're all still in, too. You know, you mentioned that. That's a good point. The the one of the uh, I think I think you were mentioning. I can't remember. It was you or David is talking about the uh, the PPP loans that are out there now, and and you're talking about line of credit, Jay. What what uh, is, is there an impact? And do you what do you what do you have to do with your business in uh, in weighing out? Look, I have got the, this PPP loan that may or may not be forgiven, or maybe I have some other loans uh, uh, from the. Uh, from the bailout that, that, that have to be paid back. Uh, should I borrow on my line of credit? What impact does it have on your line of credit? Uh, what, what's your thinking about that? I think, all, and I'll let Ramiro and, and David chime in, but I think those are all customer specific. I mean, there is no one size fits all for that. Yeah. I, I wanna pile on to what Jay was saying and, and I had said earlier is there will be life after COVID-19, Jay refers it to it as, and properly so, as the long term. 
uh, act prudently. Your, your banker needs to see that you're running the business in a prudent manner. Things that you're doing to make sure that your liquidity position uh, improves, the banker is going to applaud. Uh, things that you're doing, call it in an excess of caution at the hide of the banker or other suppliers, uh, may not reflect proper on you over the long run. Good point. You know, uh, there's a question that says, uh, I have a 401k for my last job. Should I leave it there or uh, since the cost will probably be low? Uh, and, and I want to sort of, that makes me think of another thing, which is a lot of the cost savings and cutting that some corporations are doing are actually cutting benefits. Um, and some of those benefits might be to cut the employer match of 401k. And um, I, I, let, let's deal with the first question, which is, should I, should I move uh, my, my, should I take my uh, 401 account with me or, or move it? W what's the answer to that? But then what do employers need to think about when they're thinking about cutting different uh, uh, um, benefits? So um, good question. And I guess I'll continue in our theme of uh, prohibition and moonshine and, and other uh, spirits. Uh, I've got a colleague that's fond of saying, when you have your old 401k still in the plan, it's kind of like you're, you're accessing the mini bar. You can get something to drink, you're gonna have a limited selection and it's gonna be expensive. So um, in, in almost every case, I encourage someone that has the ability to, roll, to, to do so, to roll out those funds into a IRA rollover. You'll have way more choices in terms of your investment selection. Um, and your advisor can integrate it into your entire plan versus it being this kind of dangling piece out to the side. What about the, uh, what about cutting the uh, 401k uh, uh, match for employers? Is that a good idea, guys? It's, uh, I mean, I, I hear what, what Ramiro was saying is that, and, and uh, everybody's sort of agreeing that there's life after COVID and you gotta make sure that your performers are gonna perform, but. But, uh, you know, if you're in dire straits, is that some place you want to cut or look elsewhere? Well, you know, survivability is, is the name of the game. Um, uh, David mentioned earlier, or Jay mentioned, that uh, a lot of the answers to these questions is it depends. Uh, there isn't one size fits all. It's a potential area to cut depending on the circumstances of where you're at. But like I said earlier, your top performers will remember what you did or didn't do during this crisis. And I think there's also the element of, you know, is this temporary or permanent, right? And I think you have a lot more leeway if you are in a, in a very um, difficult situation, perhaps you're in the hospitality segment and have no revenues to be able to cut on a temporary basis. But as Ramiro says, when things come back, uh, there will be a, com a competitive environment for talent and um, they're not only going to look at their current benefit package, but they're going to look at how did you uh, treat them and interact with them during, during a crisis. Yeah. And the yeah. Other, one more thought on that, Alfred, is that um, as leaders, we've got to set the example. Something that I would strongly encourage is uh, whatever medicine you're dosing out to the employees for the survivability of the company, you've got to take the medicine yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is more demoralizing than you take medicine, but I'm not. And people will remember that after the crisis. Yeah. I've got a question here that's kind of zooming out a little bit from where the, the specifics we're going in here. One is, uh, what are your thoughts about the recovery time frame, especially since a lot of the economists are saying that the recession actually started in February, uh, and some people are saying, is this going to be, you know, a, 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 a quick recovery, or are we going to see a slower, slower uh, slope? What do you think about that? I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, look, the, the, the reality is you, you talk to um, five economists and you'll get five different answers, um, and I think nobody really knows because we have so much uncertainty, both at the virus level, at the economic level. Um, I think what, what's really important is from a business management standpoint, 
and probably similarly from a wealth management standpoint that you need to um, have a plan for any of those scenarios, right? Um, and so <clears throat> now specifically with regards to South Florida, I do think that, you know, we have our own unique challenges that are probably a little bit different than if we were in call it California or New York, given our exposure to both hotels, cruise lines, um, you know, some major aviation uh, related businesses, all that will have uh, challenges over the, the near to midterm. But regardless of, of whether the recovery is fast or slow, I think you're going to have an intermediate period of, of um, challenge that it, it's really important to, to run your business um, with an eye towards managing your both your cash flow and, a, and the sustainability of, uh, of those operations during that intermediary period. Hopefully, uh, the recovery is, is quick. Um, but, you know, like I said, a lot of the things are, are, are not just purely economic. There's questions around how quickly people will get comfortable going back to things. And those are, those are unknowns that um, are, are very difficult to be quite honest for any economist to answer. It's, it's really opinions. I think, Alfred, that uh, if you were to put a gun to my head and ask me the current environment, the one word that just jumps out at me is uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty in terms of the economy, uncertainty in terms of the leverage that's in the economy, uncertainty in terms of the role that central banks have played in creating a lot of that leverage, uncertainty of the flu itself. Uh, we'll know more. October, November, is there a second wave of that flu? So to me, the magic word here is uncertainty. And to David's point, the better that you can prepare for what I think will be 12 months of uncertainty, uh, the better off you're going to be. Well, you know, the credit market doesn't like uncertainty. Do you think the banks are going to start pulling back their, their credit? Should, should, uh, should you, uh, I mean, you know, we, we talked a little bit about before that you, you got to keep a long game in mind and you, maybe you shouldn't uh, draw on your line of credit, but if the credit markets are going to start uh, freezing up, do you think that co companies need to start thinking about that, drawing down? Well, there's a difference, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is there's a difference between the credit markets freezing up like what happened in 08 and 09 and the credit markets tightening up, which is something that I expect will happen. Uh, during most of 2019, uh, the credit markets were from all the bankers I spoke to were pretty noble, pretty noble, meaning that there were a lot of banks chasing fewer good deals. Uh, so credit standards were loosened up somewhat. I think that we're in a position now that credit standards are going to be not frozen, but tightened up somewhat. The other thought that, uh, that I wanted to share, and this is just my own opinion, this doesn't come from any official source, uh, but I've spoken to a lot of bankers and some bank regulators, and the feeling is that the regulators, they acted with a very big stick back in 08 and 09. Well, in this current situation, the banks are much better capitalized than they were in 08 and 09. And the regulators themselves understand that they were very heavy handed during 08 and 09. When the regulators put pressure on banks and banks in turn, you have the domino effect, have to put the pressure on the clients. My sense, and underline the word sense, because this is not official, my sense is that the regulators are not going to be heavy handed as they were in 08 and 09. I'd be curious, Jay, what you're hearing about that. Well, I, I think the real question is, is how they're going to, to look at a lot of this PPP forgiveness. Um, you know, the banks are going to have a lot on their shoulders in terms of calculating out the forgiveness for their own clients. And, um, uh, and there could be some consumer compliance issues that come in with that. So I think in general, they're going they're you know, the, the regulators want the banks to be healthy. The banks want their clients to be healthy, but there could be, you know, a few little pitfalls along the way. Um, you know, Alfred, back to the investment markets, one thing that I want to be sure I, I get a chance to say before we wrap up is, you know, a lot of what we're doing in my business is we're, we're fighting against complacency. Mm -hmm. People get complacent. 
They, um, uh, and in the last several years, people have been able to have very good investment returns from having either no plan at all or having a poorly structured plan. And it's been a wake up call where we've hit this volatility. And uh, what I would encourage people to do uh, is not get complacent again. You know, we've kind of recovered back pretty much to where we were before we started COVID. And I guess the same analogy would apply to your business planning. You know, you've got to have contingency planning for your business. Even if you come out of this thing okay, you should, you should still be planning for there could be another crisis on the horizon of a different nature. And from your personal financial plan, don't get complacent. Um, uh, a high level of diversity is what will protect you uh, as things move forward. Uh, six months ago, no one would have predicted which stocks would have been going up, which stocks would have been going down. And no one can predict six months out from now what they'll look like. So you've got to be properly diversified and have a proper plan. Well, what about Zoom, Amazon, and Clorox? You think those are good, good stocks to invest in? You know, uh, I go back to my slide about all the information that's available. Everyone has access to that information. So where you think it might be a good idea to buy Clorox and someone else might, everybody in the whole world has access to all that information. And we feel the share price already reflects that information. So it doesn't mean the company won't do well, but it means that it's hard to profit off of uh, your insight when everyone else has the same information you do. That's true. Well, listen, we're just about out of time. I want to thank all of our panelists. I do want to um, say thank you to uh, the South Florida Business Council. I'm going to put up on the, um, on the chat the link to our website. Again, the South Florida Business Council has been put together to uh, work on regional issues. Obviously, the economy recovering and uh, having businesses thrive, especially since we're all each other's bedroom community, uh, it's going to be a regional issue. Um, it's also going to mean that we have to support our local businesses. Um, and so I, I urge you all to, to do that, to support locally. Uh, thank you to all of our guests for the amazing information they uh, put on there. Uh, I, if you all wouldn't mind plopping into the uh, chat your links to your website so that people can uh, contact you directly if they have questions or uh, if they should want to use your services, please do that. Um, just lightning round uh, closing remarks. Let, let me start with you, Ramiro. Uh, any closing words? Uh, cash is king. Liquidity is king. Be candid with your banker. Give them the good news and give them the bad news and don't beat around the bush. Jay? Get a plan. Uh, you know, don't be complacent. Um, get a plan. Uh, know that the way that people make money is by their time in the market, not time in the market. Great plan. And David, we'll end with you. You know, I think <clears throat> the most important thing is um, looking at how the world is going to change and making sure that your business reflects that. There, there's a ton of uh, opportunities that will be out there, and I think it's it's really important to to look at this in a positive light. Um, and, uh, and, and to be proactive in it, right? N nobody's going to come uh, and, and give you, um, you know, the, the opportunity, you know, right in your face. You're going to have to go out and, and get it. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please uh, make sure that you support these, uh, these, these great businesses. They're here to help you and know that all of your chambers in the region are here to help you as well. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.